Brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If you're glad about it, come on, put your hands together and sing with me. Yes, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We literally never get tired of saying or singing that around Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. It is such a joy uh, to be able to greet another day and to celebrate another day and to give God praise for another day, for God's continued goodness in each one of our lives. Thank you, Dr. Kiana, for ministering to us in song. Thank you, Minister Lewis, uh, for your ministry of music. Uh, each and every time we gather together, these wonderful singers and musicians bless us uh, with their presentation of music. And then they took it right out of the Psalms, out of which we will continue to study even this month. And so thank you so much for reminding us of what the Psalms say to us in Psalm 118, that we are to rejoice and be glad. Be glad. That is your responsibility. Be glad in this day, for God has blessed us with yet another day. And to that God be all of the glory, honor, and praise. Great Wednesday to you, my brothers and sisters. I pray that you are already having a great day and that your day will continue to get better as the hours continue to pass and that our God will continue to get the glory out of your life because you have yielded that life unto him. What a joy it is to make our way to this midweek experience as we have now entered into 
our second day of the church year. Yes, we began a brand new church year yesterday, and we're so grateful that God has blessed our church in such rich, palpable ways. And uh, we learned that on Monday evening in our church meeting, and now we continue to experience the goodness of the Lord. There's a prayer-a-thon going on during this day. We took just a little brief break for Bible study, and we're going to go right back into prayer, and we're grateful for the opportunity to continue Continue our time with the Lord. Uh, if you're watching this at the 7 p.m. hour, uh, our prayer thon will have been over by that time. But all this day, we've been praying and talking to God. And we're grateful for the opportunity that from 6 a.m. today, all the way to the end of the day, we've been communicating with a great God. And that God is worthy of great praise. Yes, we're continuing in the Psalms even this month. We only have a few uh, more weeks before our revival. Our revival begins next month on the first Wednesday of the month of October. As is our custom, every month of October we share in Wednesdays in the Word, and that will be our responsibility and reality next month. Uh, but during this month, I want to have a kind of quasi Wednesdays in the Word, uh, and you'll understand that better in just a few minutes. But I'm excited about the Word of God. I'm excited about the Psalms that give us great perspective on God's word and God's people who try to walk in God's word. And so I want to look at that uh, f- at, at the Psalms for the rest of this month as well uh, as we continue in Psalms for the summer. The summer really doesn't end until the 21st of September. So we still have an opportunity even in the month of September to share in Psalms for the summer. Today, I want to look at a Psalm that you may have quoted or heard quoted at some point along along your journey, and maybe you didn't know exactly where it was. Maybe you did. Maybe you studied it and you know it well. But I want to look at Psalm 19 today. Psalm 19. Yesterday, when we got ready to have our staff meeting, as is our custom, I asked uh, one of our staff members, the Reverend Pastor Jacques D. Dinkins, who is our minister to seniors, uh, to open us with meditation. And he took us to Psalm 19. And from then, I've been considering that psalm. I thought I was going to do something else on this Wednesday. Uh, but I got to Psalm 19 and and saw some wonderful uh, words of life for us. And I want us to consider Psalm 19 as our passage for today. Just a few verses, 14 verses. Uh, but hopefully by the time this hour has been completed, we will have a greater appreciation for those 14 verses and what this psalm means uh, for the believer. And hopefully it will carry us through uh, several seasons of our lives as we have greater respect for God and how God shows himself strong in each one of our lives. I want to pray for you now. And as we prepare for prayer, uh, we're going to look forward to the opportunity to uh, hear what God has to say uh, from his word in Psalm 19. Let's pray together. Gracious God, how we love you and praise you for who you are and for all that you mean to us. We thank you and celebrate you on this Wednesday for your goodness and your mercy toward us. We're grateful that when you awakened us this morning, we did awaken to brand new mercies. And we thank you that throughout this day, goodness and mercy have followed us. And we're grateful that at this moment in time, we can pause to share in the study of your word. We give you praise for your word that is sharper than any two-edged sword. We give you praise for your word that never returns unto you void. We give you praise for your word that you send out and heal us, even in the places where we have been broken and where we have been sundered. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you will now speak a word to us that will do for us what needs to be done in this season of our lives. I thank you for the supernatural power of your word that meets us right where we are and ministers to us in ways that we could never have done for ourselves, but can only give you the glory for the continued way that you show to us that you are strong and mighty in our lives. So may the milk of your word nourish the babes among us and may the meat of your word strengthen those who have been in the fight, in the faith for a while. May the medicine of your word heal us in those places where we have been torn asunder. We give you praise now for the opportunity to know that as we hide your word in our hearts, we will not sin against you. So speak to us, will you please? Speak to us so that we might have a greater faith, greater confidence, a greater trust in you 
on the other side of Bible study than we did before Bible study began. Speak to us, will you please? So that you can get the glory out of us to a greater degree than you ever have before. Speak to us so that we might be warriors on the battlefield for our Lord as a consequence of the word that is deposited into our spirits today. And we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to glorify your name, even as we study your word. It's in the strong name of Jesus Christ that we pray this prayer with great thanksgiving and expectation. And all of God's people everywhere said, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's study the word of God today. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. I'm going to ask that you will get your sword, as the Bible is called in the New Testament. Get the sword out. Let's turn to Psalm 19. Hopefully you've already turned to it. I want to read it for you, of course, from the King James Version in just a few minutes. But please know, as has been the custom for the last several weeks, we're going to reflect upon it uh, from the New International Version once we have read it from the King James Version. For those who are joining us for for the first time in Bible study this week, we usually look at the King James Version for these psalms because of their Shakespearean poetry, their poetic language. These psalms are poems or prayers, hymns uh, in, as uh, from their origin. And uh, so they speak to us in very poetic, uh, literary ways that are very keen and clear uh, from the King James Version. However, to unpack it and to understand it more, we look at other translations uh, as, as we continue in the study. So I want to read it from the King James Version. Um, you'll read or hear uh, some verses that are familiar to you. Uh, if you've been in the church for a while, if you've heard certain of the Psalms uh, reiterated or repeated or even rehearsed uh, in the sanctuary or in a worship setting or in a Bible study setting, and as you listen to it, be refreshed by the word of God. You have to understand the structure of the psalm, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. Um, the structure of the psalm gives to us a beautiful breakdown of, of various actions of God and then God's people. And I want to look at it. Verses 1 through 6, if you want to talk about the structure for just a few minutes. Verses 1 through 6 give to us a picture of God's work, W-O-R-K, God's work in the world. And then verses 7 through 10 give to us a picture of God's word, W-O-R-D, God's word. And then verses 11 through 14 give to us a picture of God's witness, God's witness, which should be you and me. All right. So this is a Psalm of David it is attributed to David. And when we read this Psalm of David, David takes great pains to ensure that we understand God's work. God's word and David as God's witness, but not just David alone as God's witness. You and I are called to be God's witness in God's world. And hopefully we will be able to place ourselves into Psalm 19 after we have completed our time together. Or even if you've read it before and you know this Psalm, you can already place yourself in Psalm 19 and make this a personal Psalm for you. This is a Psalm of, of wisdom. It is a Psalm that helps us to have a great greater appreciation for God and a greater love for God and a greater awareness of God in our lives. And each one of us, I submit, should have that kind of awareness for God and of God in our lives, that God is not just some deity that is separated and aloof from the affairs of humanity, but God is in touch with, in tune with God's people. And God is always at work in the world to ensure that our witness of God will be connected to the activities of God in our lives, that God is always up to something in our lives. We've been talking about trust quite a bit as we've dealt with these Psalms for the summer. And as we've done that, we've said that God is always showing to us that God is a trustworthy God, that God is worthy of our worship, worthy of our adoration, worthy of our confidence. And when you read Psalm 19, it is to really help us to adore God in a greater way, help us to revere God, help us to worship God. And so you get a picture of what it means to have a God like this, a God who is almighty, a God 
God who is all powerful, who is always in control. And to see this God being revealed in this picturesque language of Psalm 19 should help you to be a better witness for God in the world. When the psalmist gives to us the wonderful work of God in the first six verses, the psalmist is helping us to understand this God is powerful. This God is amazing. This God has done great things. And then when the psalmist gives to us information about the word of God, it reminds us just how much the word of God can work in our lives if we allow it to do so as we apply it to our lives. And then as a consequence of knowing and seeing God's work and hearing and reading and receiving God's word, then we go forth to be God's witnesses in a world that needs to know of God's love and care. And so over and over again, you'll see uh, those those three points presented to us as we break down uh, the tripartite parts of the psalm. Now, now also, my friends, I want you to likewise see uh, this emphasis of light in Psalm 19, the emphasis of light. There is this this emphasis that light is a necessary thing. Light is a necessary thing. You'll see it revealed uh, as the as the word of God talks about us, the sun in the first few verses, S-U-N, the sun in verses one through six. And then you'll find out that the word is illuminating as we read the second section of the psalm. That the word is illuminating and it is illuminating all throughout our lives. And then we become the light in the world as we go forth uh, to be God's witness in the world. These are some beautiful um, pieces of his of, of, of wisdom that is get, that are given to us from this historical piece of literature. And when we read this piece of literature, uh, we understand it first as that we, on which we can ruminate. All right. This is a psalm that calls your thinking to the fore. All right. We're supposed to think about a few things. We're supposed to allow our minds to work. I've often said uh, that we can never be people, especially at Wheeler Avenue. We should never be people who worship God void our minds. You know, you can't leave. If we were coming to church, I would say, don't leave your mind on the parking lot when you come into the sanctuary. Bring your mind with you because we are a thinking people. God has given us the agency of thought, the capacity to think. And the psalmist is calling us to think and think critically about this God that we say is almighty and all loving, that this God is all encompassing. That's the theme of Psalm 19, that God is all encompassing. There is no space where God is not at work. Hallelujah. There is no space where God is not at work. Remember, we're talking about the structure and the substance of the psalm, that there is no space where God is not not at work. Be encouraged that God is at work in your home. God is at work on your job. God is at work in the circumstances of your life. God is all encompassing. He pervades the lives of his people in, in, in several ways. But we'll see how the psalmist illuminates that for us in just a few minutes. And so we want you to keep these in your mind, these thoughts in your mind and see uh, what God's work reveals to us, what God God's word does for us and how we as God's witnesses can live a life that is pleasing unto God. Let me read to you now from the King James Version, Psalm 19. Hear the word of the Lord. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the earth, of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. 
The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. That 14th verse takes me back to Emmanuel Baptist Church, 8301 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, where Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry was my pastor. It was on each and every Sunday morning at the beginning of worship uh, that our choir would sing the Lord's Prayer to begin worship. But before we would begin to sing the Lord's Prayer, the preamble to the prayer would be verse 14. Many of you have heard that verse repeated over and over again in some setting of worship. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I can recall uh, singing those words. I didn't even know it was in scripture until many years later. But right there in Psalm 19, verse 14, the psalmist makes this request of God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Yeah, that should be the request of all of us. We'll get to that verse at the very conclusion of our of our time together. But I am grateful for this psalm and for the way it is presented to us so that we might have a great appreciation for God. Did I mention the three things we're talking about? God's work. God's word and God's witness. We are called to be God's witnesses in the world. You know that from the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks, speaks to those first band of Christian believers who at Pentecost, who, who at Pentecost, before Pentecost, uh, even 10 days before Pentecost, Jesus appears to them and he says, I'm going to give you power to be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth and all of us brothers and sisters are called to be witnesses in the world for the glory of God. Now let's be clear, whether we are acting like good witnesses or not, on some level or another, we will be considered a witness in the world. Sometimes our witness is wonderful and, and laudable and applaudable, but there will be some times, if we're not careful, that our witness will speak not so well of the God that we claim to know and love. And so the psalmist has to ask the God to do some things for him. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm already talking about the end of the psalm, but each one of us is called to be a witness for God. We'll come back to that. Let's begin at the top of the psalm. Psalm 19, verse 1. One of my favorite verses of scripture uh, in, in the psalm is this first verse. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Let me let me just give my personal testimony. When we as a family go on vacation, we like to go to places where we're on the water. We like to see the water, a blue azure water that God has created. And almost every morning I get up and look at that water and I quote this verse because when you see the wonders of God, the handiwork of God, when you look up into the sky and see the beautiful sky that God has created, you have to begin to test about the grandeur of God, the enormity of a God whose handiwork, as the scriptures call it, the handiwork of God is so phenomenal. You know, from Genesis chapter one, we talk about the creation of God, what God has created, how God has created. We know that God spoke things into existence. But now this Psalm David, this Psalmist David chooses to use as his expression of the creativity of God, that it is God's handiwork. It is God's 
God's design. It is God's molding, God's fashioning. And he says that the heavens declare God's glory. That word glory is kabod in the Hebrew. That word kabod literally means the reputation of God, the reputation of God, that the heavens declare the reputation of God. Listen to how David is putting these words into perspective, in poetic perspective. He says that the the heavens speak of God's amazing ways, that the heavens speak of God's grandeur in the world, that the heavens literally talk to us. When you look at the heavens, when you look at the, the, at the, at the beauty of the sky, when you look at uh, the firmament, the ground and the water and every other part of God's creation, you get to have the glory of God, the reputation of God revealed that through God's creation, you see how amazing God is. Come on, a God who can speak and all these things come into being that the sky is still in the place where God stretched it out and that the waters are still rolling and that the birds are still flying and chirping and that all of God's creation is still fixed and fit in the world that God has placed it in. That ought make you give glory to God, that the heavens are trying to tell you, you serve an amazing God, that the earth is trying to tell you, your God is splendid, awesome, magnificent, majestic in all of his ways. And whenever you get a chance, you just ought to take some time, slow down and appreciate all of the world that is around you. Every now and then, just go out and look up into the into the sky and just bless God for being the God who has so creatively brought this world into being. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. And I want to read this to you now from the New International Version, for it gives a beautiful perspective of these next couple of verses. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Oh, that's beautiful. That the work of God is so magnificent that it speaks to us of the splendid nature of God. Now, every now and then we ought not have to depend upon another tangible blessing from God to revere God, to honor God, to glorify God. There come times in our lives where all we need to do is look around us, look about us and see how God has craftily made all that exists. And that alone should allow us the privilege of revering God of magnifying God, of glorifying God, that because God is God and the God who has created the heavens and the earth, that's reason enough to revere God and to rejoice in God. And so every now and then when we understand that we must we must mature in our faith, that all of our faith journey is not about receiving another tangible blessing from God, but it is just e- expressing to God how much we are applaud God, how much we approve of all that God is by all that God has already done in creation, in creation, that God has done so much in creation that ought to make us stand in awe of him. Yes, stand in awe of him. And so every now and then we are called upon to simply look at the creation that God has given to us. And you notice how the psalmist David deals with the sun. He says that the heavens are a tent that has been pitched for the sun. And all of the earth 
And no matter, no matter where the farthest points of the earth may be, the entirety of the earth feels the warmth of the sun. That's how amazing your God is. That's how phenomenal your God is. From the day God spoke the sun into existence, created the sun that it might brighten the sky, it has continued to do what it does and no space is untouched. No space is not reached by the sun's radiance, by the sun's brilliance by the sun's heat, by the sun's light. It is a beautiful picture of how the psalmist wants us to understand that God has shown himself to be the God that allows his creation to speak for him. Now, now this is important because the creation is speaking for God in verses one through six. I mentioned to you that you and I are supposed to be God's witnesses according to verses 11 through 14. So the psalmist is setting up the reality that even though the sun and the creation and the heavens and the firmament are speaking for God in verse in verses one through six. Listen to what he says. Verse two, day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. All day and all night, they're speaking to us about God's grandeur. They, but, but they have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun, that the heavens are so expansive that they are the covering for the sun. However, the sun is reaching every single part of the earth. No one is devoid of the magnificence, the brilliance of the sun. So there is no one who can say that they have not been touched by the awesome creative ability of God. Every single person has been touched by that awesome creative ability of God, and that ought make you stand in awe of God. It ought make you revere God. It ought make you love God. It's like it's like this bridegroom who comes out of his chamber. It is the picture of after the bride and the groom have had their night of consummation of the marriage. He comes forth excited about the possibilities of a brand new life, a brand new experience. And now he is letting the world know of how wonderful his life has become as a consequence consequence of the bride that has now become his wife. And that's what the son does. It shows up and shows everybody just how excited he is to have been created by God, excited it is to have been created by God. It is like the champion rejoicing to run his course. This, this one who has competed and has won as a consequence of having made his body fit and had made his body ready uh, to receive the reward because of what has been accomplished. And no one keeps that to him or herself. They tell it and share it with everyone with whom they come in contact because they recognize that their God has done great things. All right. And so he says, that's what the sun does. That's what the firmament do does. That's what, that's what the heavens do. And that's what we ought to celebrate, that this work of God is so magnificent, so brilliant that Psalm 8 says, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And he begins to talk about the creative work of God in Psalm 8. He says, you've set your glory above the heavens. He says, you have shown to us your reputation above and in the heavens that every day we get to wake up to a manifestation of the grandeur of God. Mm. Every day we wake up to a manifestation of the glory of God. This literally suggests that even if things aren't going right in your world right now, you still have reason to revere God. And even if circumstances aren't as favorable in your life right now, you still have reason to wake up and revere God. Just look outside, look up, look around you and begin to testify that the created order of God is still reason enough for me to rejoice in the God who is the great creator. He's the great creator. There is, there is this beautiful picture of the work of God. But as you move to verses seven through 10, you not only see the work of God, you understand some things about the word 
of God. Now, what we'll understand in these next several minutes is that there are several words that are interchangeably used to describe the word of God. There are several words that are interchangeably used to describe the word of God. Let me read them for you from the New International Version. I'll read just from verses 7 through 10, and we'll come back and deal with them in just a moment. The law, there's one, of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes, there's another, of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts, yet another one, of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. We'll stop right there. We'll get to verse 10 shortly. Do you see the picture of the word of God and what the word of God means and how the word of God is is variously interpreted interpreted for us to understand uh, how it can be used interchangeably? The same is true uh, for Psalm 119. We may deal with that next week. Psalm 119 gives us the picture throughout its many verses of the various words that are used for the word of God. And I bring this to our consideration because we're preparing for revival, right? We're starting our new church year, but revival comes in October. And we call that Wednesdays in the word because we need to understand what the word of God does for us. We need to understand how the word of God impacts us if we allow it to do so. We need to understand how the word of God can literally transform us if we permit it to run its course in our lives, to do its work in our lives. If you're listening to me at the top of the, of the, of the study today in prayer, I mentioned that the word of God is at least three things for believers, at least three things. It is milk for the new believers, the babes in Christ. It is meat for those of us who have some more seasoning. We've been in God for a long time, longer amount of time. But it is medicine for those who are who are broken and weary and wounded along life's journey. The word of God is always doing something for us. You, you cannot take for granted the power of the word of God because the word of God is always doing something in our lives if we allow it to do so. The reason why we come to Bible study each and every Wednesday, the reason why we listen for a word from God in worship is because the word of God is always intended to be either milk, meat, or medicine. Yeah, milk, meat, or medicine. At all points along our journey, we're supposed to be developing. That milk is developing that baby, is strengthening that baby, is making the baby's bones stronger, making that baby more sturdy and secure. The meat of the word is continuing to hold on to those places in the body that need sustenance and strength, all right? And the medicine of the word is meeting you at those broken places, those vulnerable places, and healing you in ways that you could not be healed without the word. I mentioned it in, the, in that prayer, as I recall now, that the word of God, uh, according to the, the gospel of Luke, was sent by Jesus and it healed them. He sent his word and healed them. There is something about the healing power of the word of God that is like the balm in Gilead, according to the Old Testament, B-A-L-M, the balm in Gilead. It heals us. It, it mends our wounds. It, it binds up our broken places. And so when the psalmist gets to verses 7, 8, 9, he speaks to us, David does, about the power of the word of God about the efficacy of the word of God. Watch, about the necessity of the word of God. No believer can mature, can grow, can develop without a healthy appetite of the word of God. No believer, no Christian can mature, develop without a healthy appetite of the word of God. That's why you came to Bible study. You didn't come to Bible study to shout. Well, you knew when you came to Bible study, this was not a shouting time. You may affirm the word. You may say, amen. You may say, praise the Lord. But this is not the excited, ecstatic shouting time for us. This is the time for us to process, 
This is a time for us to internalize. This is a time for our minds to be expanded, right? This is the time for us to have a greater understanding of God's word. Solomon says, in all thy getting, get understanding. So we try to, to get the word down into bite-sized pieces during the Wednesday experience so we can have a greater appreciation for what the word does in our lives. And the word of God is spoken of throughout the scriptures as that which is necessary, needful in the life of believers. And let's see what the word does. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? It refreshes the soul. Yes, Lord. Oh, when you've been beaten down, when you've been weary along the journey, uh, when life has taken its, its toll on you and has tried to frazzle you and beat you down to the core, the Bible says you get a good dose of the word of God, it will refresh your soul. It'll bring you back some re some rejuvenation. It'll give you some more excitement and some more passion to, to, to press your way through this thing called life. And that is a necessity for the believer. But let's be, let's be clear. Life will wear you out. We all know that life will tear you down, try to catch you off guard and throw you and, and toss you hither and yon. And we have to have some word in us, get some word in us to refresh us. That's why we have this midweek experience. We had a Sunday experience. We looked at Psalm 34. We got excited about it, even as we were challenged by it. But now we look at Psalm 19 and we understand that the word does more than just excite us and make us happy. It refreshes us. It gives us our second wind. It gives us life again. It renews us. It, uh, it builds us back up. So whenever you get that word, whenever you've gone from Sunday to Wednesday and Monday and Tuesday were rough, you get to Wednesday and you say, yes, here's my second wind. Or between uh, Thursday and Saturday, life tries to come at you in various ways and try to make you uh, revert to who you used to be, Sunday morning comes or Sunday afternoon if you're a one o'clock service member and it just gives to you that effervescence again and refreshes you because it is perfect. It knows how to do exactly what needs to be done in every one of our lives. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The soul is that inward part of the individual. We've talked about this more than once, that nefesh is the Hebrew word for soul. It literally means it is the breathing part. It is the part that keeps us alive. And the word of God refreshes us, gives us our life back, gives us our strength back, gives us our vitality. All right. It refreshes the soul. I love that. And verse seven, likewise says the statutes is still the same word for word of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. It means that that babe in Christ who is just coming into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the goodness of God that just getting to understand the principles and precepts of God, that person is made wise through the word. Yeah, even our babies in the in the children's church, even those babies who are having the word spoken over them in the nursery, they begin to get wiser and wiser. And you can see some things happening in some of the children's lives that you never would have expected at that level of their maturity if they have a healthy dose of the word in them. Please hear me. The word is not just for old people. The word is not just for middle-aged people. The word is likewise for young adults and teenagers and adults adolescents, and even the toddlers who can understand. And even if they don't understand, a healthy, continual dose of the word of God will shift you from what you have been to what God wants you to be. Listen, there are children who sit in church all the time and they don't seem like they're connected to what's going on. They seem like they're totally aloof. But as they stay in church, they stay in worship, that word is working on them even when they don't know it's working. And later on, in their life's journey, they'll be able to pull up some word that they didn't even know they knew, that they didn't even know where it came from uh, because that word has been spoken over their lives. Listen, I tell you that not as something that is theoretical, not as something that was taught in a class. I tell you something, I tell you that as something that is practical. It is my own lived reality. You all know that I'm a church baby. Maybe you don't know, but I'm a church baby. I grew up in church. I was in church every 
single day of my life as a child, literally, uh, because our church had a church school. Uh, we had a Christian school there at Emmanuel. I was in church Monday through Friday at the church school. I was there in the evenings for all those ministry meetings and the like. I was there on Saturdays for choir rehearsal and, and all the children's activities and there all day on Sunday. And I didn't know as a child that all of that word that I was hearing, all of those verses they were making me memorize, even if I didn't know what they meant, all of that was developing me was making one who was simple or unlearned to become wise. And there's a wisdom that comes with this word of God that you cannot get without the word of God. And so I invite every person, no matter your age or stage of life, no matter where you are on, on life's journey, continually develop yourself through the the reception of the word of God for the last three years now. This is the third year that we have. I've asked us to read the Bible every single day. And just because we've been in quarantine, there's some people who thought I'd forgotten because I hadn't said it over and over again. But many of you get the text messages because I want you to read the word. It does something for you. Even when you don't completely understand what you're reading, there's still something that happens. It is a supernatural process, right? It is a supernatural process. And so when you get this word in you, it it makes wise the simple. And you can trust the word of God to do that. You can trust the word of God to do that. Verse eight says, the precepts, I'm reading from the New International Version, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. There's that effervescence and excitement about which I spoke that happens every Sunday, even on Wednesdays. You just hear that word and something about the word will put a smile on your face. It will, it'll make you rock in your seat. I've been trying to sit still all the while. I've been trying to teach this, but there's something about talking about the word and receiving the word that makes you joyous in heart. It makes you excited. It makes you excited. I submit that the gospel is intentionally called gospel because it is good news. It is good news and good news makes you joyous makes you joyful, all right? And whenever you hear this good news, it makes you joyful. Listen, there are people who can testify. Just hearing certain verses recited brings joy to the heart. Every Christian ought to just get some, feel some kind of way, be moved in some kind of way when you hear uh, certain verses of scripture. Well, I mean, you don't have to have them preached to you. You don't have to have them explained to you. After certain years of Christian experience, there are certain verses that just do something to a Christian. I mean, it just happens. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's just not casual for a Christian. That does something for the Christian. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That does something for the Christian. As a matter of fact, as I'm quoting these verses now, somebody is feeling some kind of way because you recognize God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You recognize weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Those, those are those things that just, I mean, they can't miss. They just, they just bless you from the inside out. Okay. When you understand those verses and what they mean to the believer, I mean, when you hear no weapon formed against you shall prosper, that just joyous, that makes you joyous in spirit. When you hear certain passages of scripture, like, like uh, no, no weapon formed against you. I just mentioned that one, but um, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's what Joseph says in the book of Genesis. Those kinds of verses, when you apply them to your life, it brings joy to you. And I want our believers, I want the believers of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church to get excited about the word, to be joyous about the word, to perk up when it's preaching time, to perk up when it's teaching time, despite who the preacher or teacher may be. Just get excited because you recognize that God is going to say something to you that's going to affect your life. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That that brings joy to the heart. Yeah, those kinds of verses are the verses that we cite and quote over and over again in church intentionally. Because we want you to have that experience of verse eight, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. 
bring joy to the heart. No believer ought be able to sit through the reception of scripture, reception of the word of God and not have some joy. Listen, this reception of scripture is not just a cognitive experience. No, it's not just a cognitive experience where I'm just expanding my mind. Yes, my mind is being used in the study of God's word, in the reception of God's word. But likewise, God has given us our emotions to celebrate what our minds have understood. Oh, bless his name. God gives us our emotive ability to celebrate what has been what has been processed through our cognitive ability. Cognition and emotion are interconnected. Don't fool yourself. Don't think that because you are such a cognitive individual that you cannot be emotive. No. Uh, when I think about our ancestors, our ancestors understood some things and so they celebrated. Yeah. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. Then my soul cries hallelujah. You got it? When I think, I cry out hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. And so the scriptures give to us a joy that we cannot get anywhere else. I'm losing time. Let me keep on going. Uh, the, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. I spoke about that illumination. We talked about the sun in the first six verses. And now we see that the word of God illuminates us. Psalm 119, about which I spoke, and we'll probably get to later on, says, Lord, that the word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. And then it also says that Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, that it illuminates my life. And I'm grateful for the illumination that the word gives. It's almost the picture. It is the picture of the scales falling from one's eyes. That the scales fall from one's eyes and you can see very clearly. That's what happens uh, to Paul on the road to Damascus. He saw going to Paul and he's, and he's blinded. And then all of a sudden the scales fall from his eyes. It's, it is akin to um, the fact that I don't see very well without these glasses. But when I put my glasses on, there is a brilliance, a radiance, an illumination that I get, a, a better vision that I have as a consequence of the, of the eyes being strengthened and brightened from what has happened in my life. The word of God does that. It gives you brightness. It illuminates your path. It shows you which way to go, which way not to go. It shows you the things that you should do and the things that you should not do. And that, uh, according to the word of God, is the commands of the Lord that are radiant giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, enduring forever. That There is no time that the word does not work. There is no time that the word does not cleanse. There's no time that the word does not, that does not work in us to fix us from the, from what we have been to what we should be. Uh, that word pure is literally uh, in the Hebrew translated ceremonial cleansing, ceremonial cleansing. And the, uh, the ancient Israelites understood that ceremonial cleansing had to be repeated repetitively done. You're always cleansing yourself. You get you get dirty and then you have to wash yourself. But the, this Bible says that the word of God is pure. It's pure. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. So it is not a temporality to this. No, when the word of God begins to work in you, it works in you continually, consistently, even when you don't know it's working, even when you don't feel it working, it is working. It is continually doing what it's supposed to do to keep you pure, keep you cleansed, keep you clean. The decree of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous that God's word is not is not something that is that is unstable but it is steadfast and secure and all of the words of the Lord are righteous they are helping us to engage in right living in right ways of living and then he begins to talk about how good the word is he says the word is so much precious more precious than gold more than pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. He says this word is both is both rich and sweet. Hallelujah. Is rich and sweet. It has so much to it that we cannot exhaust it with our human capabilities. And the word of God is rich and sweet and you ought to feast on it and enjoy its richness, its vastness and be made better as a consequence. Now he moves from God's word and the pivotal transitional verse is verse 11. He says, by them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Now we're moving, to, we're moving to God's witness. That's all of the servants of God. David speaks of himself as, as well as all of us. By keeping the decrees, 
by keeping the commands, by keeping the precepts, the statutes, the law of the Lord. When we do that, the Bible says in verse 11, we will be warned. All right. We will be warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. We understand the errors of our ways. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But we also understand the reward that God gives to us. And God is saying, listen, I'm going to make your life better, better, better. As you get more and more word in you, you're going to be live better. You're going to love better. You're going to walk better. You're going to talk better. There will be a betterment <laughs> that is made in your life as a consequence of getting the word inside of you. You will be warned. You'll know you have a God consciousness. That's what that is all about. You have a God consciousness and you will know there are certain things you can't do like you used to do. You'll be warned that there are certain things you ought not say like you used to say, certain ways you ought not treat people like you may have once treated them. And then you will likewise get the great reward from coming into an understanding of God's word. He says, who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. He says, you can't do this by yourself. You can't, you can't even have an understanding of your faults uh, by yourself. You need this word to guide you, to direct you in the ways where you err in the way. All right. You can't discern your own errors by without the word. And so you need the word of God so that you can know your faults, know the places where you are messed up. Yeah, because all of us are messed up in certain places. And then he says, when you know that, you'll ask the Lord to forgive you of your hidden faults. Forgive me of those things that I should not have done, that I did, and I knew I shouldn't have done, <laughs> but I did them anyway. He says, keep your servant also from willful sins, all right? Certain things I didn't know I was getting into, other things I knew real well that I was getting into. Keep your servant from also from, also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Let not the old person that I used to be be in control of me now that I've got this word in me. All right. And so he says, then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. I will be the person that you want me to be. I will be upright before you. I will be the person who can come clean before God. I can be the person who comes boldly into God's presence and know that I have been washed. I have been cleansed. I've been made pure as a consequence of the word of God. Then he closes with that classic line that every witness should close with. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The New International Version says, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, my rock and my redeemer. He says, Lord, I want to make sure that every time I open my mouth, I give honor to you. I give glory to you. This is going to move me away from backbiting and scandalous words, and it's going to get me away from gossip and being rude to people because those words are not pleasing in God's sight. Those words do not edify anyone. He says, I want those words in my mouth. And even when I don't speak it, if I'm just meditating on it, I'm just thinking about it. I'm thinking about how to get him back, how to knock him down, how to get her told. If those are the thoughts that are permeating my heart, God, I need to be cleansed from that because that does not please you. That does not please you. And you are my strength. And I can do this. I don't have to live like I've always lived, think like I've always thought. I don't have to be rude like I've always been rude. I don't have to be unloving like I have been in the time in time past because you're my strength, my rock. It is the stabilizing force. It is the strength and security found only in God. And you're my redeemer, my redeemer. That word literally means it is a relative, almost the next of kin. He says, I know I can do this because my redeemer who buys me back, that's what the word redeemer means, buys me back from the places where I have been held, held captive and held bound. When you buy me back, I will have the opportunity because you're my next of kin, you're the closest this one to me, I will be able to have a refreshment of my life and a pleasing life to God that I could not have found had I not gotten in this word and recognized God's work. Oh, church family, it's a beautiful psalm. When we think about this psalm, we ought to think about how because of the work of God in the world and the word of God that has been 
imparted to us. We can be greater witnesses for God because we have cleansed our mouth of words that dishonor and displease God and other people. And we've cleansed our minds by the washing of the word of God from all those things that clutter our mental capacity. And we are now, we have now our hearts are made clean for the purposes of being used by God. And God will strengthen us and get us back because he's next of kin, because he is our redeemer. He buys us back and allows us to be in right relationship with him. And we can give him glory today, tomorrow, and forever. And that's Psalm 19. And we thank God for it. And we celebrate his word even on this Wednesday. Thank God for your sharing with us in Bible study today. If you've been blessed by the word of God and you want to be a part of the family of God, you're not yet a part of the family of God. I invite you, my dear brother, my dear sister, to contact us at Wheeler at New Members Ministry at WheelerBC.org. New Members Ministry at WheelerBC.org. And we'll connect you to the family of God that gathers at Wheeler Avenue, even in a virtual reality. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never been saved, redeemed by the one who is our next of kin, even Jesus Christ, our elder brother. I invite you to get in communion with him, in, co in connection with him. Let him be your redeemer. We'll talk about that a little bit on Sunday and allow him to make a difference in your life. If that's you, my dear brother, my dear sister. I invite you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Save me, redeem me and make me to be the person that you want me to be. And he'll do that for you right where you are. If you need more assistance with this building business of salvation, you need to more, know more about it. Email us at newmembersministry at wheelerbc.org. Newmembersministry at wheelerbc.org. You see it there. And we'll be more than delighted to help you along your path of Christian discipleship, becoming the child of God, the Christian that God has created you to be. I'm excited about the word of God. I'm excited about a brand new church year. I'm excited about the word of God. And I hope that you will be excited about the word too. Until we get back together again next Wednesday, Lord willing, I want you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a great rest of the week.